This is what I do. I train people how to fight with ancient arms and armor as authentically as possible. I've always been fascinated by how these weapons were used and the place they have in our history. Just how effective were they in the heart of battle? I'm going to put these medieval weapons to the test and discover how they help forge our history on the battlefield. The spear. In essence, it's little more than a sharpened stick, one of the oldest and simplest weapons in the world. And yet, it played an important role in many of this nation's crucial battles. The medieval arms race transformed this straightforward weapon from infantry spear to the lance of the mounted knight. Locked under the arm, the lance was the weapon of choice for the knights who clashed at the Battle of Lewis to fight for the first parliament. The spear was at the heart of romantic chivalry, as epitomised in the heroic figure of St George. But back in the hands of foot soldiers, the spear emerged victorious against cavalry, helping to win the key battle in the Scottish Wars of Independence at Bannockburn. I'm going to explore how the spear went full circle from infantry weapon to cavalry weapon and back to infantry again in just 300 years. For the Saxon and Viking peoples, the spear was a weapon of high esteem. The sagas sing of spears. It was valued almost as greatly as the sword, but the spear was by far the more common weapon. Every warrior had a spear. The spear has reach. The spear can be used to thrust, for slashing, and to stab. The spear, of course, can also be used to throw. For the Saxons and Vikings, the spear was a weapon for foot soldiers, but this was about to change. The Normans, descendants of Vikings who'd settled in France, combined the skills of fighting with spears on foot with another tactic, riding their horses into battle. Duke William of Normandy was a master of cavalry tactics. He not only beat his neighbours into submission, but also the King of France in a succession of wars. Now, William was ready to challenge for the English crown. He set sail in 1066. The Bayer tapestry records his invasion, right down to the weapons he brought. Fabulous. Look at this for fabulous detail. Really does show you the complex logistics and elaborate preparations required to launch an invasion. Barrels of arrows, bundles of swords, rails of armour and racks of spears. There are spears everywhere on this tapestry. And William must have loaded thousands onto his ships. The spear was at the forefront of his first wave of cavalry attack. William spent a fortune on his invasion, especially transporting his highly valued cavalry. This extremely expensive weapon, the Mounted Knight, was about to make his first appearance on the British battlefield. The spear would help to decide the fate of the kingdom. The Normans were Vikings who rode into battle on their horses. Their first weapon of strike was still the spear. The Norman cavalrymen at the time of Hastings, 1066, didn't use the spear as we see it in later periods, tucked under the arm in what is known as the couch position. That comes in later, that's for the impact charge. At this early period, the spear is still for throwing. They would ride up to the shield wall and throw their spears. It could be used to stab down on either side and we see it on the Bayer tapestry being held out at arm's length, carrying routed troops from the battlefield. The English army relied on the collective security of a densely packed shield wall. Against William's horsemen, their principal tactic was to stand firm against the onslaught of the mounted spear attacks. For the Norman cavalry, it was exhausting work. In a battle like Hastings, they have to run up the hill many, many, many times. 
the shield wall held firm for nine hours. They would ride up, throw their spears, ride away again, turn, come back, up the hill, throw their spears, and away again. The cavalry worked hard, and it wasn't as efficient as later when they got thicker lances and then tucked them under their arm, and then they could get in and really start to push you back. At Hastings, the mounted spears failed to break the shield wall. It was Saxon indiscipline that finally lost the day. They broke ranks and charged forward. William's cavalry was able to quickly turn about and decimate the scattered troops. King Harold was killed, and Duke William secured his reputation as William the Conqueror. From the moment the Normans got on their horses to throw their spears in battle, a catalyst of change had begun, which was to revolutionize medieval warfare. New techniques developed as the spear completed its transformation from infantry to cavalry weapon. At first, it was held out by the rider, who used the horse's momentum to assist the strike. Later, it was locked under the arm, and the spear became the lance. Horse, man and spear, a single deadly projectile, now fully harnessing the power of the horse. This tactic would come to dominate warfare, with knights riding shoulder to shoulder in massed lance charges. And so the medieval knight came thundering onto the battlefield, heralding the age of impact. Down there is the little Sussex town of Lewis, and some 200 years after Hastings, the might of the spear would again decide the fate of kings. At the bottom of this slope, Henry III, his kingdom torn by civil war, was preparing to defend his royal authority, while up here, rebel baron Simon de Montfort was rallying his troops, ready to attack. Principal troops on both sides were knights, cavalry, all armed with long spears. This would be one of the greatest impact battles in British history. Ha! In 1264, there hadn't been any fighting in England for over a generation, but the country was now in the grip of a civil war. Henry III, an arrogant and autocratic king, was at odds with his barons, led by his rival, Simon de Montfort. Hold up here in Lewis Castle were the troops of the king. Somewhere out there was the rebel army. At stake was the future of England's first parliament. The knights facing their first battle at Lewis would depend on skills developed through many years of intensive and dedicated training. In order to explore the essential elements of that training, I'm going to take our novices through a course of basic horse and lance skills. We've got evidence from medieval manuscripts that one of the ways they started was with a foot quintain. So you start without the horse, okay? Now, there are a number of writers on jousting and lance skills. King Duarte of Portugal is one of the most famous. And he says that what you need to do is lower the lance poco e poco, little by little. And the reason for that is, imagine once you're on a horse, if you level it down there and you're galloping along, look what the end's doing, it's bouncing all over the place. You can't possibly hope to hit anything. So what you need to do is develop hand-eye coordination lowering it gradually as you go, poco a poco, little by little, let it just come into your peripheral vision and it just smacks the centre as you walk through. The apprentice knight might begin his service and training at the age of seven. A robust education of hunting and fighting equipped him with the skills he would need for war. Of course, in the great charges that took place here at the Battle of Lewis, the knights were mounted on horseback. There were over 3,000 cavalrymen on the battlefield. And combining lance and horse skills are the main objective of a student's training. 
the next step is to get doing that with a little bit of speed mm -hmm. and, and, and a little bit of bouncing about. So in order to do that, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. Right, gentlemen, here is your mount for the day. Come on. Oh, no. She's really? called Eliza, <laughs> OK? It's absolutely authentic. There are medieval manuscripts which show tilting carts like this, wooden horses on wheels. We still need to isolate the skills you need to get. OK, absolutely full tilt. Get him through there. OK, stand by on my words and charge! And stop. The awkward bit is when you bring it down, and you bring it down towards the target. It was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be, yeah. Uh, especially judging the distance. And when you get it right, it feels great. In return for land and status, knights were obliged to undertake military service to their immediate overlords, not to their king. So when the barons rebelled against King Henry, they brought with them an organised and loyal army. To find out more, I've come to Lewis Castle to meet an expert on 13th century England. In 1264, Simon de Montfort was at the head of a great political movement designed to impose a, a programme of reform called the Provisions of Oxford on King Henry III. They were far more radical and revolutionary than Magna Carta because they really reduced the king to a cipher. They said a baronial council, representing in some way the community of the realm, should govern England for the king. Which is a sort of proto-parliament. In a way, yes, yeah, something like that. But King Henry was determined to keep all his royal power. In response, de Montfort had ridden an army out of London to bring the king to battle. It was a courageous decision, with the governance of England the prize. And it came to a head here at Lewis. It's a wonderful situation, isn't it? It's situated here in this bowl, this gap in the South Downs. A natural stronghold. A natural stronghold. And then it's got this magnificent castle. And the key thing, it's a castle of one of Henry III's chief henchmen, John de Warren, Earl of Surrey. That's his flag up there. Henry is completely safe here, or feels safe, and he's got the sort of knowledge that Montfort's somewhere out there. Montfort wants to fight. How is he going to bring Henry to battle on ground of his own choosing? And that's, of course, where he had this wonderful solution of the night march. De Montfort was approaching from the north. To force Henry to fight, he needed to occupy the high ground above the town. In his way was Boxholt Wood. To his knights with unwieldy lances, this was a potentially impenetrable obstacle, and de Montfort had decided to cross the woods under the cover of darkness. Riding through dense woodland with a 12-foot lance clearly has its problems. But I've noticed in some manuscripts that they have a lanyard about halfway and they're actually carrying the lance with the point down. Now we see like this is holding in good balance here. And we can see that the butt end is not rising above my head. So now I should be able to walk through the trees with not too much obstruction. That works much better. There's really no obstruction, no problems with that at all. So I'm sure that although our images of knights with their lances over their shoulders in parades, when Simon de Montfort and his army were creeping through that wood on their way to Lewis, they would have carried their lances with the point down. as the linkages between man, lance and horse became ever more connected, so more of the impact was being transferred to the horse itself. And so there was a need for bigger, sturdier horses. 
early medieval horses were really quite small, much shorter than this. And if you look on the Bayer tapestry, you can see the rider's legs hanging well below the horse's belly. So that gives us an idea of the size. But as the impact charge developed, they needed these bigger, sturdier horses, not necessarily taller. Now, Louis here is actually a little too tall for a medieval horse. A medieval horse may only stand this high, but he's about the right conformation. He has the right characteristics. And Henry II introduced breeding programs in the 12th century so that you get horses with denser bone and short backs, which is good for weight bearing and good for getting collected underneath to deliver more thump and a really awesomely powerful musculature. Go on. Go on. Beautifully done! Great strike! Years of dedicated training sharpened a knight's lance technique ready for battle. The cavalry of de Montfort's rebel army, bearing down on Lewis, were about to get the chance to test those skills for real. Overnight, Simon de Montfort's army had picked their way through Boxholt Wood, killed Henry's sentries and deployed on the downs overlooking the castle. His cavalry were silhouetted on the dawn skyline. Their lances sloped over their shoulders, ready and defiant. And although Simon was heavily outnumbered by the king's forces, his bold initiative had given him command of the high ground. If this king wanted to quell the rebellion, if he wanted to reassert his royal authority, he would have to fight on Simon's terms. As King Henry and Prince Edward hurriedly mobilised the royal army, Simon de Montfort, high above the town, ordered his lines ready for the clash of arms. Well, of course, the first thing they would have seen is the you castle see down there. amazing view of Lewis behind you. You've seen the castle. And of course, you also get a wonderful impression of, of Lewis itself, don't you, in this gap in the South Downs, the ooze cutting through. And that would all have been marsh, presumably. It's very yeah. marshy ground, equal it's marshy ground out there from where Montfort came. Yeah. And that's why it was so protected. And you can see what a tremendous advantage he's got up here, whereas the King and Edward really can't see what their left and right are doing. This is the only way in and the only way out of Lewis. Exactly. It's the best way in for any attacking army. You can now charge down towards the town and carry all before us. In the town, the Royal Army hastily prepared for battle. This would be the first ever full-scale engagement of cavalry with lances on British soil. The outcome of the Civil War would rest on a single mass charge of knights. Though the prospect of the impact charge was daunting, de Montfort felt he had God on his side. I think there's a distinct note of piety about it all because Montfort got all his army to fling themselves on the ground with their arms outstretched so that they could confess their sins and be blessed. Compare that to Henry, of course. He's coming out of the Priory. According to Montfortian chroniclers, I mean, they'd spent the night in wine, women and song, um, not at all preparing in a spiritual way for the battle. The Battle of Lewis was of vital political importance. It would decide not only de Montfort's future, but also the future of England. Years of training might provide a knight with skillful handling of horse and lance, but he still lacked real combat experience, though there was another, more violent element to his martial education. Medieval chronicler once wrote that a youth needed to hear his teeth crack and see his blood flow before he could face real war. And thus, the tawny was born. The development of lance warfare had catalyzed a change in armor. Full face guards were introduced and there were reinforcements to the chest defenses. It was in such armor that the early tawny was fought and it was fought with sharp lances. This was not mock combat. This was licensed warfare. Early tourneys were far less formal than later jousts. They were fought between opposing companies of knights, sometimes as many as a hundred on each side. and they were supported by infantry, just like in real war. The intention was to capture and ransom a fellow knight, but fatal injury was frequent. 
The tawny replicated in a very real way the tough reality of the battlefield. But it could only go so far. However well trained the knights on both sides were at Lewis, nothing could completely prepare them for the battle to come. This would be far bigger and far more brutal than anything they had experienced before. Two armies faced each other up the hill. At the top, de Montfort gradually eased his men in good order a little way down the slope. At the bottom was Prince Edward, Henry's impetuous son. And with brash bravado, he led a charge up the hill. A charge that would decide the day. Seven hundred and fifty years ago, the English battlefield was dominated by the lance. Originally a weapon of the foot soldier, the simple spear had been adopted as a cavalry weapon and linked to rider and horse, developed into a deadly projectile unit. In 1264, this hill above Lewis would bear witness to the impact of the first clash of lances in full-scale pitched battle on British soil. The mounted spear would determine the fate of the kingdom, but no one knew what the human cost would be. In order to learn more about the sort of impact that they would be facing on the battlefield at Lewis, we've established some scientific tests. This is foam aluminium, which the scientists tell me behaves in a very consistent way. So I'm now going to run at it with spears in a variety of different modes. First, I'm going to try it like one or two Normans are seen to do on the Bayer tapestry, holding it out at arm's length like that. Then I will couch it, tuck it under the arm like that and really use the horse's momentum to drive it home. The relative size of the holes driven into the aluminium foam will give us a picture of how impact delivery improved through the ages. The impact has made an impression but it's not very deep. Now I'm going to tuck the spear under my arm using the horse's momentum to add more power. Ha! In addition to technique, the design of the spear or lance also changed dramatically during the period to deliver yet more impact. This is a different type of lance. It's bigger, it's sturdier and it has shape. In the quest for impact, one of the first things that was developed was a shaped hand grip, so that it prevented recoil in the hand. The next development, which happened in the 13th century, time of the Battle of Lewis, they developed something else. It's called a graper. It's a big flange that sits behind the hand and butts up against the shoulder and the armpit, really locking the lance in to give immense impact. Grapered lance clearly packs a bigger punch. Well, that was a fair old wallop, wasn't it? I really yeah, felt that, that too. That, yeah, clean mean. through. Yeah. And it's made a mark in the wood yeah, behind. You can see it there. But what would these lance blows have done to the armour of the day? We've brought our battered target to the Royal Military College of Science at Shrivenham to complete the test. From the depths of the holes, punctured in the aluminium foam, the experts can calculate the energy imparted by each lance blow. After calibrating the machinery, we can then reproduce our blows in the laboratory, dropping our lance head against replica 13th century armour. The first blow replicated the Norman spear at arm's length. Next, the couched Norman spear. Well. Wow. The first one obviously just made a prick in the material, so the lance held out at an arm's length is doing nothing to this quality of armour. But then when we upped the energy to a lance couched under the arm, did just defeat the armour. You can just see a small penetration there. This time the machine is going to drop the lance head with an energy equivalent to the impact from a couched lance fitted with a graper butted up against the shoulder. The advancements in lance technology delivered a significantly greater impact. Let's have a look at this damage. 
This armour has clearly been penetrated, but although the knight wearing it undoubtedly received a heavy blow, he was protected against serious injury. For the poorer infantryman, who could only afford mail or just a padded coat, it was another story. And it was the rebel infantry at the Battle of Lewis who would first feel the true impact of the massed cavalry charge. Simon de Montfort's foot soldiers were formed up here on this hillside. Charging towards them up the slope were Prince Edward's cavalry. Edward's knights with lowered lances smashed into the infantry on Simon's left flank, the London militia, and he drove them from the field spitting them on the end of their lances like so many suckling pigs. Prince Edward's incisive initiative shattered Simon's infantry. The rebel left wing collapsed and was chased from the battlefield. Impulsively, Edward continued the route for over an hour. His cavalry chased Simon's infantry four miles from the field, leaving his father, King Henry, with a vastly depleted force. This was Simon's great chance, and then de Montfort and his barons lowered their lances and took their chance. The impact of de Montfort's downhill charge was overwhelming. Worcester Cathedral, there's a rare British depiction of the Clash of Lances. This fabulous medieval carving, which dates from about 100 years after Lewis, nonetheless shows us the tremendous forces of the impact charge. Just look at this horse here. He's been rocked back onto his haunches. It really shows how that linkage between lance, man and horse, how as a single projectile, all the force is given from the horse and all the force is transferred to the horse. He's toppled over. We can just imagine the carnage that would have been wrought as Simon de Montfort's cavalry came rushing down that hill and crashing into Henry's forces. The crack of lances. Horses overthrown, knights toppled, the screams of men and beasts. As one of the chroniclers tells us, the horrible and human clangor of the clash of arms reverberated everywhere. Henry III came here to Lewis Priory. As night fell, de Montfort's men shot volleys of fire arrows into the town, setting nearly every building ablaze. As the king spent the long night, deep in prayer and contemplation, he realized that come the dawn, he would have no option but to surrender to the rebel cause. The mounted lance had proved decisive at Lewis. For the first time, England was governed by a parliament. But its reign was short-lived. Within a year, Prince Edward had raised a fresh royalist army and crushed the revolt and de Montfort at the Battle of Evesham. But the seeds had been sown and the concept of a parliament had been born. When Prince Edward became king, he consolidated his power by waging war and constructing formidable castles in Wales and Scotland. The Scots, in reply to Edward's fearsome cavalry, came up with a new use of the spear, a simple but effective tactic for the age-old infantry weapon that would take the lance head on. In 1314, just 50 years after the Battle of Lewis, Edward I's son, Edward II, led a great army north to Scotland, ostensibly to relieve Stirling Castle. Sitting as it did on a vital crossroads in the heart of Scotland, the English could not afford to lose this strategically important castle. 
With Stirling under siege by a small Scots army, Edward II led a colossal force that included two and a half thousand knights with lances. He expected a speedy victory. But here at the Bannockburn, Edward walked into the shadow of one of history's abiding legends, Robert the Bruce. Spies had informed the Bruce that a huge English army was on its way to Stirling. So preparing for war, he developed his new tactics using infantry with spears to defeat the lances of England's knights. Awaiting Edward's arrival, he took his men to the Tor Wood to train in secret. There were, of course, knights in Scotland, but they really didn't play as, as prominent a role as, as the infantry had done. The 13th century had been fairly peaceful for the Scots. They weren't developing uh, their military uh, capability. They were doing other things. And the way, I mean, because Bruce's campaign had raged for many years prior to Bannockburn, but he'd done it as a guerrilla fighter. That's absolutely right. It, learning perhaps from people like, like William Wallace, um, that's, that's what the Scots had learned that they had to do if they were going to combat this mighty English army. There's no doubt about that. So they couldn't really take them in a pitched battle. They really hadn't succeeded in doing that, and Bruce had set his head against pitched battles with the English. But in order to secure Stirling Castle and rid Scotland of the English, the Bruce would have to make a stand. I don't know whether he thought he was going to fight a, a battle, but he certainly wanted to put up a good show uh, to stop the English from getting to Stirling Castle easily. And to do that, he had to use trained men and to, to maybe take on the Scottish tactics to a, to a new level. In his month in the Tor Wood, he had trained a completely new type of army, and they were armed with a completely new tactic. At its heart were tight, mobile formations of spearmen, known as shiltrons. The great thing about the shiltron, of course, is that it uses spears, which are so easily fashioned, aren't they? It's quick and effective, basically. It's, the materials are there. You can put a weapon in someone's hand and train them. And if you've got the time, which I think Bruce took, um, you can fashion quite an effective fighting force. Robert the Bruce at Bannockburn pioneered a new way of using the Shiltron. The Shiltron was formed in a circle, so you could take attacks on all sides. But Bruce's revolution was he could make his circle move, so they could become attacking forces, not just defensive forces prey to the archers. Now, a real Scottish Shiltron should have a thousand men. We haven't quite got that here today. But hopefully we've got enough of you to form into a circle. That's what's important. On your own, I could write any one of you down. But standing together with long spears sticking out all around, the cavalry simply can't get in. So we need to see how difficult is it to train for this. Robert the Bruce had a month in the Tor Wood and he got a very effective army. Let's see what we get. Ha! Hey, take one Gary has spent many years training Civil War enthusiasts in pike drill. Now, his challenge is to train our volunteers and create a workable, movable shiltron. What we're going to do to start with is start getting you working as a single body. You're going to be working together, you're going to be working closely. So what I want to start with is one single clear line. We're going to start by going through three basic static positions. The charge, you're going to put your foot behind the butt of the pike, brace it and step forward with the left foot. That then allows you to bring the pike down into your left hand, leaving your right hand free. So anything comes up and runs into the end of it, it's not going to slide off down the hill. From there, to recover back to the order, step back, transfer the pike back into the right hand. We're back where we started. Nice and clear. All we need to do from that is form you into a circle. So you're now a tight, tight body. It's hard work. They are really heavy. And of course, because they're so long, they're really difficult to control. And so when you've got them up on your shoulder, you feel as though you're tilting backwards and going to fall over. The spears of Bruce's Shiltrons were almost never tested. As the vanguard of the English army approached Stirling, 
they chanced upon the Scots king in a dangerously isolated position. Robert the Bruce rode up and down his lines, putting his shiltrons in good order. Axe in hand, he was out in front of his army, just as the English came into view. And one young English knight saw an opportunity. This battle could be won before it even started. At full tilt, Sir Henry de Boon charged the Scots king. The Bruce rode out to meet him, and as they closed, at the last minute, he swerved. A contemporary chronicler said that Bruce cleft him to the brisket. And of course, what Bruce had done was he'd got inside de Boon's lance point. And once inside the point, there was little de Boon could do. Now a thousand-man Shiltron can't swerve at the last minute. But it has the advantage over the mounted man, provided that the Shiltron's spears are longer than the horseman's reach. How are they doing, Gary? Very well so far. We've got the makings of a good static Shiltron. They're looking pretty impressive. I, mean, I was watching from the hill and you've got them in good order. Just get them to go into the charge. Charge! Yeah, if I come round you, you don't know where I'm going to burst in. I could burst in anywhere. You're not going to let him? Because I could... Oh, yes, nice. Excellent. Good, yeah, I can't get in that. Keep tracking him. This is good. Get that by him. This simple experiment is really showing me how hard it must have been for the English cavalry to break these spear formations. Well, I kept him off. Order. Excellent. On the first day of the Battle of Bannockburn, Bruce's army held the high ground and he arranged his men into four shiltrons, each of around a thousand men. One with Edward Bruce, one with the Earl of Moray, one with the Black Douglas and one with Bruce himself. Sir Robert Keith had a small reserve of Scots cavalry. The English vastly outnumbered the Scots. Edward II thought this would be a walkover. He didn't even think the Scots would stand and fight. And the bold hearts of English chivalry charged in, thinking to wipe these people from the field. But even under immense pressure from Edward's knights, the Bruce's static shiltrons held firm and the bodies of the English horses and the English knights fell and stacked against the Shiltron walls. At the end of the day, the English retreated to think again. On day two, the Bruce would have a different tactic. On the second day of the Battle of Bannockburn, the Scots took the fight to the English. Scots' morale was on a high. On the previous day, they had soaked up waves of English cavalry charges. Now it was their turn to go on the offensive. All their training was about to pay off. In disbelief, the English watched the tightly packed Shiltrons advance ever closer. The Shiltrums have the advantage because the English can't really deploy because over there, as you can see, the land starts to dip away on that side, so they're hemmed in there. The Bannockburn is, is quite a barrier over on that side, it's a deep ravine. So there's really only one way and the Scots are coming that way. And slowly but surely the English are pushed back. Their numeric advantage means nothing because most of, of the guys behind are not, are not able to deploy. They can't actually engage no. in, in, in fighting, they're just all hemmed in and on a relatively narrow front. Yeah. The Shiltrons are jarring their spears into just the horses. Moving forward. Yeah. The great enemy of the Shiltron was the archer. King Edward brought his forward, but they were contained by the Scots cavalry, bowmen and the difficult terrain. Now it was a straight fight between cavalry and Shiltrons. Lance Left. versus spear. Right, we've cut him off. The mobile circular Shiltrons could force the English cavalry back and presented no weak points to an outflanking attack. Keep tracking him as he goes round. It's exactly the same as before. Our test shows just how hard it is for cavalry to tackle a hedgehog of spears. Hold it together. Especially one that moves. All he's doing is circling us now. This is working fantastically. Order. 
extremely effective tactic with a very simple and cheap weapon. That combination of weapons and tactics was decisive. So this is it? Um, this yes, I think is so. where it happened? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it was Sam Slaughter? It certainly was, and, and not as anticipated on the Scottish side. It's the, it's the English who, who really get it. King Edward narrowly escaped with his life. His army were less fortunate. They had no choice but to cross here at the Bannockburn. Hundreds drowned in a sea of churning mud. Those that followed crossed the river on the bodies of their comrades, only to be hacked down by pursuing Scots. A contemporary chronicler wrote, so great was the spilling of blood that it stood in pools on the ground. The Shilterans won the day, and having tried that against our very small Shiltron, I can see how impregnable this bristle of spears, this, this Scottish thistle was against the cavalry. Now, with a bigger mass, with a thousand men, you can see how a mobilized Shiltron can really cover the ground and dictate the battle. And from Bannockburn onwards, the infantryman was in the ascendancy and the common soldier with his spear was a big challenge to the chivalrous knight with his lance on horseback. The spear had come full circle and was starting to defeat itself. Robert the Bruce had won a famous victory. His Shilterans had secured Scotland's freedom from the English crown. Bannockburn became synonymous with Scottish independence, remembered for the spears of the Scottish infantry defeating the lances of proud Edward's army. It was a turning point in medieval military tactics. This was by no means the end of the lance or the mounted knight but it was the beginning of the end of their total supremacy on the battlefield. The cavalry was no longer an unstoppable force, but the horseman and his lance still had a vital role to play. He was used for scouting and skirmishing and ambush. The knight on horseback retained an obvious advantage over infantry in isolation. But on the battlefield, his role was soon to be fully integrated with that of the common foot soldier. These innovative tactics were employed in the 14th century against the armies of France in the Hundred Years' War. The English in particular found a characteristic new way of fighting. The knights would often dismount and fight on foot, and they would fight as part of an integrated unit a team. They would have a couple of archers and infantrymen with spears or halberds to work as a cohesive unit within the battle. They were recruited together and they would travel together. And they got their name from the principal weapon of the knight who led them, the lance. Now, also during the Hundred Years' War, there were often peace treaties and lulls in the fighting, and this brought unemployment to professional soldiers. And so these units, these lances, would go off in search of employment, fighting for foreign armies in Italy and other countries in Europe. They were known as freelancers. Many knights now became soldiers of fortune. They served not their lord or king, but themselves. One such freelancer was Sir John Hawkwood. Starting out as a humble tanner's son in Essex, Hawkwood enjoyed a meteoric rise, making a fortune from fighting other people's wars in France and Italy. Enough wealth to have this portrait painted by Uccello, one of the most sought-after artists of the day. The success of Hawkwood's freelancers had made him one of the most famous knights in Europe. The spear undoubtedly had an impact on the outcome of British history. At Hastings, the spears of mounted Norman knights hastened the demise of Anglo-Saxon England. The lances of armoured knights dominated the Battle of Lewis, giving England's barons the power to challenge their autocratic king. A 
and the long spikes of Robert the Bruce's Schiltrons brought England's chivalrous knights down to earth at Bannockburn. The simple infantry spear went from strength to strength as an anti-cavalry weapon. But the lance of the mounted knight, for all his training and expensive equipment, was eventually eclipsed by large professional armies and new ways of waging war. In time, the lance would survive only in the joust, now a spectator sport rather than training for war. By the end of the Middle Ages, the knight in shining armour was increasingly less relevant on the battlefield. A romantic warrior from a bygone era, whose world the spear had first created and then brought crashing down.